This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. This week's Changemaker is Ron Terwilliger, the Chairman Emeritus of Trammell Crow Residential Company, a national residential real estate company, and the largest developer of multifamily housing in the country. Ron is currently spearheading the Center for Housing Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. He also chairs Habitat for Humanity's Global Development Council and serves as chairman of the Enterprise Community Partners Board of Trustees. Ron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Katie. It's nice to be with you. Great to have you here. So your life is so intriguing. Your philanthropic contributions really colossal and your achievements are so impactful. Let's talk about you before we talk about what you've done. How did your life story evolve in a way that brought you to where you are now? I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, kind of a lower middle income family. My parents hadn't gone to college, but my brother and I were both really excellent athletes and I got to go to the Naval Academy. When I got out of the Navy, I went to Harvard Business School and got into real estate. To my surprise, uh, made a lot of money. And so as I tell my life story, you know, when I became the age of 55 and realized I was worth over a hundred million dollars, I decided to think really hard about how to deploy the good fortune I had had totally unexpected. And since my wealth comes primarily from housing, mostly from rental housing, although I've done for sale housing and community development and resort development, I thought I would give back of my time and of my treasure, mostly in the housing field, although I'm currently the chairman of the Naval Academy Foundation, and I've given the Naval Academy a lot of money too, as as you know. But housing kind of seems to be where I can contribute the most. And as I say to people, we're talking about shelter here. And unfortunately, too many people don't seem to know what a crisis exist today in the United States, much less worldwide, in providing a simple, decent, affordable home to a family. You mentioned that you had attended the United States Naval Academy. And before we get on to the affordable housing aspect of what you're doing, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight your naval service. And we thank you for that. I have some Navy influence in my own life. My grandfather, father, brother, and now even my son has signed a Navy contract and is attending the Citadel. So if you were going to reflect on your time in the Navy, maybe even how that impacted your approach to business and even giving, what would you say that impact would have been? Well, the the Academy, I think, really shaped my future more than I would say my naval service, although, you know, you can never disconnect them all. I, uh, you know, I played two sports at the academy, so I had to really budget my time carefully and uh, got out in 1963 and went into the Navy for five years. I was in submarines for part of that time. I was a supply officer, which ultimately resulted in my getting out and going to business school. But I think uh, the Academy, I'm chairman of the Naval Academy Foundation now. I spent time last month on a retreat with some of my fellow board members, and everybody told their story about how they got into the Academy and how it shaped their life. And I think it just gives you a sense of honor, a sense of discipline. You know, it's leaders to serve the nation, mental, moral, and physical leadership. And I think uh, academy grads have an edge coming out of school uh, because of what they went through and, the, and the, the leadership aspects of it. So I think that shaped my life. And, uh, you know, I never knew anything about business because my dad never went to college. So I had to figure out where I wanted to go. And I figured that out at Harvard Business School based on a real estate course. But the Navy is a big part of shaping my you know, destiny as an 18 to 27 year old. And so I give back to the Academy financially and now serving as chairman of the foundation. Well, and the Navy has a unique way of also training people, not just on the structure and the honor and duty and respect, but really creating that sense of resiliency, which I'm sure has been fantastic as you went into business, because it's a um, definitely a curve of ups and downs. Let's talk about some of your 
contributions to business, even before we get to the the current philanthropic contributions that you're making, you know, when you were in real estate and multifamily housing, that's, I'm assuming, where you first got your philosophies and the realization of the dire crisis of affordable housing. What was that like for you when your eyes kind of started opening to the current state? Yeah, you know, I had the good fortune to become the national managing partner at Family Pro Residential, which not only financially was incredibly lucrative, but it gave me exposure to um, the whole country. We had 23 offices we built in probably 30 some odd states. So I had a broad perspective of the U.S. I started serving in leadership roles because of my profile as the managing partner and ultimately became uh, a board member at Habitat, which I eventually chaired and am still engaged with. And I got just a sense as I traveled around, we were building market rate housing. We built some affordable housing. We had one division that built low income housing, tax credit housing. But as time went on, and as I saw more around the country and I traveled to all these cities, I saw how many people were desperate for a decent place to live. And so it just kind of shaped my understanding of what was going on in this country because uh, I grew up, you know, my dad never made $10,000 a year in his life working two jobs, but we did have a simple, decent home, an 800 square foot home, three bedroom, one bath. It was adequate. It was not, I didn't feel handicapped at all by that, but so many people I know, and I began to realize don't have even that and have to move from house to house as they get foreclosed on or as they get evicted because they can't make the rent. Uh, so it seemed like a really important, you know, basic human, to me, a basic human right, a right to housing that was not, even in the richest country in the world, the United States still has a terrible housing crisis. And I just thought I was going to do the best I can to, to try and address that. You said that we can no longer afford the continued silence about the crisis in housing. So what does the opposite of silence look like for you? I have tried to figure out how to make an impact. I'm still trying to figure that out. I just started a housing policy center at the bipartisan policy center because I do believe housing is a nonpartisan issue. And that to the extent that funding is a part of the solution, that it should be a bipartisan issue. Republicans and Democrats ought to get together. I spent three years walking the halls of Congress. I created a foundation. Once I realized how bad things were, I actually learned about the magnitude of the crisis as much from giving a speech um, at Harvard. Uh, first one, it wasn't a government, uh, former HUD secretary. Uh, I gave this speech and I researched it carefully. And that's when I, the order of magnitude of the crisis became apparent to me. So I created a foundation. Um, I, I got a gal named Pam Patno, the woman who ultimately became Deputy Secretary of HUD. And we started talking to congressmen about the problem. And what I was astounded to find out was, you know, with, with really uh, one exception, Chris Coons, who's a Democrat from Delaware, didn't seem like anybody really understood that we had a housing crisis in the country. I'm probably overstating it, but we did a lot of research to point out what the crisis was, why it mattered, and then we had to come up with ideas as to what you could do about it. And what you can do about it is to either help build more affordable homes, which by the way is becoming harder and harder as construction costs and land costs are escalating. You have to uh, find a way to supplement the income of residents. And that's what the voucher system does. But we only give vouchers to one out of five people who are eligible. So right now, the United States is not investing enough to help house its citizens. I think uh, it's not only at the federal level, but that's where the big money is. And we do spend a lot of money at the federal level. The biggest subsidy historically has been the mortgage interest deduction, which is really poorly targeted to you know, people who can afford homes and, and, and itemize on their tax return. They're not the people that really need the help. Um, so I think it's getting everybody concerned about the problem 
the federal government can do a lot more and needs to. State and local, where you know where the zoning rules are made, they can do things. I was on a call yesterday where we talked about uh, accessory dwelling units being approved in California. California has changed their zoning laws so that single family lot, you can build two units. We'll see how impactful that is. But the federal government needs to provide more subsidy and more incentives and the state and local governments need to do their part, not only to, to build housing, but to make sure the housing is in a neighborhood of opportunity where families can grow and where kids can get decent education. That's another challenge we have now because of all of the redlining, the segregation. So many low-income families are trapped in poor neighborhoods that are unsafe and have failing schools. So you've mentioned increase the supply, provide subsidies and adequate funding for the existing structure. You've mentioned provide more incentives, creatively look at zoning laws that may be prohibiting, you know, the additional affordable housing or the development of something that's, you know, not just the single family home and also preservation of existing stock. And that has been the housing platform or the roadmap, if you will, for many people who have been in this industry for quite some time. And like you mentioned, you know, there's either lack of understanding of what the need is or lack of will or lack of bipartisan support. And one of the things that we've seen is, you know, when you have a national emergency and you have a situation like COVID roll in, it really exaggerated the housing instability of what the nation is presented with. And it's so unusual, like you mentioned, you know, we've got a country that has so many resources, but why we're struggling with this core issue, there is a disconnect. I assume, and not to put words in your mouth, but I assume this is why you've launched the Bipartisan Center to kind of start your vision here and work through this. What is that looking like? Well, interestingly, I'm going tomorrow to DC and have a meeting with my advisory board. We, we had hopes that in the Build Back Better bill, there was north of $150 billion set aside for housing, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And Senator Manchin is now talking about maybe other legislation that could improve the deficit, which seems to never happen. But uh, we're now worried that any new legislation that replaces Build Back Better, they'll, the Congress will do what they always do, which is forget housing. I mean, and, and not only Congress presidents, when's the last time you heard the president in their State of the Union talk about the need for housing? You know, I quote the 1949 Housing Act, which set an aspirational goal for the United States for every American family to have uh, a decent home and a suitable living environment. So they kind of talked about the home, but then the environment of the neighborhood. Um, that obviously has never been funded and probably been forgotten by most everybody who was born after that. But it's going to be difficult. Uh, we have to get the attention of the people who can make a difference, and we have to make them believe it's a priority because now with Ukraine going on, you're going to see more pressure for us to spend more money on the military. There's already on the Biden administration a lot of pressure to spend more money on the, from a progressive standpoint on the social side. There's just so much money to go around and housing always seems to be forgotten. A basic human need and it just seems to be forgotten. You know, you noted that the 1949 Housing Act, you know, where both political parties came together and set forth a national objective for decent homes, suitable living for every American family. But we're clearly not there and we definitely haven't reached the finish line. So what do you think it's going to take? I think it's going to take leadership, I think, we, and I was hoping President Biden would be this leader. I think it's going to take somebody to make it a national priority. Um, there is a lot of negatives going on, of course, at the local level, but they're, they're not getting everybody's attention. And we, we just need to make it a national priority. It's interesting, the Urban Land Institute, where I have a housing center, and I had an advisory board meeting yesterday. Urban Land Institute is a, is a big platform for people from all over the United States and actually internationally now in all aspects of real estate. And they set three priorities 
one of which is housing. So the Urban Land Institute figured out that housing is a real critical aspect of the real estate industry and needs to be emphasized. You know, I would love nothing more than President Biden and his next State of the Union to make this a national priority, call on governors, state legislatures, local policy councils to find ways to house their citizens, to make it a basic human right in everybody's mind. Sadly, we're so far from that. It's, it's, it's amazing to me because we are, I believe, the wealthiest country in the world that has really never spent since the 49 Housing Act, any emphasis on housing as population. So do you think the biggest roadblock to fixing the housing crisis is just, you know, the political will or political legislation? Um, Because, you know, clearly when we provide millions of dollars in emergency rental relief, we find money for priorities. Um, So is that one of the biggest, you know, roadblocks here? Well, you know, you said it earlier, but if you think about it, the home builders now said we're 6 million units short. Rental occupancy is higher than it's ever been. We had rent increases in this country averaging close to 20% last year. In some places like Palm Beach County, where I live down here in the winter, 38%. At the same time, rents are going up, costs are going up, construction costs are going up faster than I've ever seen in my 50 years in the industry land costs are going up. So the problem is moving away from us in terms of the cost equation and the rent equation. It's getting worse and worse. I think what we have to have is more supply. We have to preserve, as you mentioned, what we have now affordable. Some of the low-income housing tax credit programs early on only required 30 years of affordability and actually you could get out after 15, I think, uh, those should be permanent. Anybody who uses a low-income housing tax credit, those, those uh, units should be permanently affordable. We've got to find a way to preserve the units that currently exist. That's very hard because apartments are so expensive now. So we've got to build more that's affordable and stays affordable, preserve what we've got. And then I think we're not going to get there unless we add to the demand side. So the vouchers today, which could be modified to be more landlord friendly supplement what people's income is they pay 30 percent the vouchers then move from 30 percent up to market rents i think we're going to have to dramatically increase what we call a demand side subsidies Um, and then if everybody at the local level would do their part stop exclusionary zoning allow accessory Mm -hmm. units get creative like california is trying to do with allowing more density um, if people could have, you know, turned nimbyism into yimbyism, as the terms go, uh, we, we could make a big dent in this. But it's, it's a shame to see so many American families desperate to have any money left over after they pay their rent for, for food or medicine. It's just, uh, it's just not what the United States should stand for. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And on that note, let's take a break. But coming up in the second part of my conversation with Ron Terwilliger, Ron shares his hopes for the future. What I want for the world is a world in which everyone has a decent, affordable place to live in an opportunity neighborhood that is safe, has good schools, has access to medical care and nutritional food. And it would be fantastic if we could ever get there. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.